Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Invisible Museum Tour. My name is Jeff Olson. I'm the Art Education Director for Royal Talents North America, and I will be one of your co-hosts. Hope everybody had a happy Passover and Easter weekend. Nice to get some rest, uh, being with family, I'm sure. Uh, today's show is sponsored by Royal Talents North America and the Z Art Academy. Uh, at the end of today's broadcast, we will also be picking a name from the comments. So you want to make sure you ask a question or comment, and we're going to be sending out a set of the Rembrandt oil paints. So stay tuned to the end. We're actually going to announce the winner at the end of the show. So make sure you stay in for that. So as always, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce you our venerated museum guide. She's an award-winning artist whose work is featured in numerous prominent private and public collections around the world. She's an art historian and educator working for over a decade at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. She's the co-founder of the nonprofit Project Ah on a mission dedicated to exploring connections between Western esotericism and the arts. And she is also founder of the Z Art Academy where she mentors students of all ages. Everyone, the remarkable Genya Gershman. Genya, how are you? Hello, so glad to be back here. So glad to have everyone back. Uh, we appreciate everyone who's returning. This is our 13th Invisible Museum tour. So we are just thrilled to be Fantastic. here. Thank you, Royal Talents North America. Thank you, Jeffrey, for being uh, just incredible co-host. So it's been a great I, journey, hasn't it? <laughs> right, right. So today, uh, 13 is a lucky number in our family. My grandparents met on the 13th and got married on 13th, then my parents. So we're going to show you just how lucky 13 can be. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to talk about a little bit about the previous tour, and I'm going to start our PowerPoint so I can reference. Let's I did see. want to make one comment, everybody. It's just Jenny and I on the show today. Our moderator uh, isn't here uh, right now. So what we're going to do is uh, hold off on responding to audience questions until the end. Definitely still put them in there. Um, but uh, uh, just know that we won't be able to answer them during the show. Uh, and then we'll get to them at the end. And of course, as always, Jenny does just, just a fabulous job of going back after the broadcast to reply to everybody's comments. Absolutely. And I love, love, love your comments. So please keep them going. I could also feel your vibe. So don't stop. Um, I just wanted to say that last tour um, in January, it was dedicated to Katie Kolovitz, who was a woman artist dedicated uh, personally through her art fighting against the war and never would I imagine that a month later in February, I would be following in her footsteps and I created um, with a team, teamwork, uh, te a great, wonderful team, um, a portrait that was to try to help uh, the situation in Ukraine and it's called First Face of War. I just wanted to quickly flash it because those of you who listen to Katie Colwitz's tour, this will make a lot of sense. If you haven't heard the previous tour, I highly encourage it encourage you. And uh, we were able to raise $100,000 uh, to send to Ukraine to, to help them. And the reason I also bring it up is because uh, uh, my partner in crime, uh, Adrian Roop, who hopefully is watching right now, who helped uh, start a movement that's called Brushes Over Bullets. And we encourage every creative person, so all of you qualify who are, who are listening, if you have a poem or a painting or a sculpture or any kind of dance, a photography, film uh, posted and tag it with brushes over bullets to show us support against the war. So just wanted to throw it out there. Great job, Jenny. And uh, today we start uh, our, our tour with a question. The title of the tour is the question, why is Mona Lisa so famous? And I hope like myself, you've asked that question and wondered about it. And I don't want you to feel bad about it because you're in good company. Here you see Van Gogh and Vermeer <laughs> <laughs> looking, checking her out from behind and saying anything special. So what is it about this painting? Why this painting by Leonardo? Why not Raphael? Why not? Michelangelo, how is it that it becomes so iconic, right? So um, I hope you enjoy the opening slide. <laughs> That is great. <laughs> um, and uh, a famous uh, writer, a French writer, we're going to have a lot of French quotes because, of course, Mona Lisa being painted by an Italian artist, Leonardo da Vinci, has become associated being French because she's been housed for so long in France uh, that the French basically uh, claim her as a French work of art, ironically. Um, and here, André Marlowe, uh, 
Malraux says, museums not only display masterpieces, they also create them. And of course, location, location, location. She happens to be displayed at the Louvre Museum. Who has been or who hasn't been to the Louvre? Even if you haven't been there, you've seen countless of pictures of Mona Lisa on her display. I know Jeff. Jeff just shared with me that he was there on his honeymoon. Is that right? Yes, yes. Kelly and I were there on our honeymoon. We've been there before and seen it, but we had the unique experience of making it into that room when nobody was there. Uh, and this is so incredible because there is a rule, there is a very strict museum rule uh, in most museums, but also at the Louvre Museum, that only 30 people could crowd at any point at one work of art. That rule, no security uh, officer will ever put in place in front of Mona Lisa or else they'll risk their life. There are hundreds, if not thousands of people crowding in, try, trying to take the photo. You cannot see her even if nobody was there because she's in multiple glass boxes covered with bulletproof glass. And really, um, you probably would see it on Google Art Projects uh, magnified better than actually standing there. So uh, why is that? Why is she protected, so protected and so famous and so coveted? So uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, look at the original, just talk a little bit about her. And she's, of course, uh, it's interesting. She's one of the four Leonardo da Vinci's surviving portraits. So he doesn't have that many. And uh, she's considered the largest portrait uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. And yet she's still the smallest. Uh, when she used to be in the Italian gallery, she was the sm smallest artwork there. So she's quite petite, only 30 by 21 inches. And she's painted on a poplar panel. And considered a little bit of a iconic miraculous quality though she has if we look a little bit closer a thousands little cracks uh, throughout the surface of the paint when we x-ray when we study the wood panel it is miraculously uh, conserved absolutely as if nothing happened from Renaissance really in phenomenal condition uh, without ever being preserved so a little bit of a iconic quality so you know how how could this be, right? How could this wood be so fresh? Um, I also wanted to point out that one of the reasons that she's considered so um, interesting in, in or paradoxical that she's so famous because usually, typically, a famous work of art is either of a Madonna, for instance. We have a lot of uh, images of Mary or uh, divinity, right? That it becomes very, very iconic. Or we have um, uh, some kind of royalty, a regal, somebody very high up in the court. Uh, she's none of those things. She's not a famous. In fact, it's even debatable uh, if it's a portrait of Mona Lisa, what we uh, what we're going to discuss with you as well. So she is basically a nobody. Uh, and yet, uh, everybody knows what what she looks like. So that is fascinating in and itself. Uh, <clears throat> and something that's really amazing about this portrait, a couple of things that I want to mention. One is that we all examine her and for the next hour or so we are examining her together. But it's more likely she's examining us. This is a portrait that truly, I mean, we've all heard about the portrait that follows us with the eyes. This is the case. She is studying every specimen who comes to this painting throughout history and intently returning the gaze, which is very unlike for a Renaissance woman. This would not be considered polite or up to status of, of a noble woman to look and stare you back in the eyes. Uh, the other thing that I find really interesting also uh, the fact that even though you see all these little cracks again you could see it in this detail when we take uh, studies uh, scientific studies like x-rays etc uh, you can't detect any brushwork from left by Leonardo's hand we know he used super fine brushes and we know that he took years to paint it, but I challenge you at home to make a work of art that technology cannot detect brushwork. I mean, this is really uh, uh, almost like a, you can think of it as an Olympic uh, achievement, human achievement to erase yourself out. The brushwork is really your sense of presence. I made that. It's like a signature in a way to erase yourself out of the work of art to the degree that it looks like it just dropped from God, right? Drop from heavens uh, is really, truly to me remarkable. Isn't it, Jeff? Have you tried that? 
No, I'm always doing the opposite. <laughs> but uh, it is amazing, right? His mastery and really invention in many ways, along with some of the Northern European painters of the glazing technique is, is just phenomenal. And, 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 you know, I think that's where you could really start to seeing um, copies or student work versus Leonardo. I mean, when you look at this particular painting, um, it really becomes the, um, if you study her face and really look where the nose begins and ends, where the cheek, where the nose begins the cheek or the cheek becomes the mouth, there are no boundaries, right? So uh, this kind of sfumato, the famous uh, term that Leonardo came up, uh, smoky, sfumato quality is really unsurpassable. So the quote that I wanted to share with you, uh, she really seems to look at us and to have a mind of her own. Like a living being, she seems to change before our eyes and to look a little different every time we come back to her. And this is by one of the greatest art historians, Gombrich, uh, in his famous uh, 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 series, The Story of Art. Um, <clears throat> so who hasn't marveled at Gombrich? And he says, you know, this work of art is always different. It's always changing like a living being. I mean, this is really incredible. And she truly did change throughout history. Everybody claimed some different explanation of her. So much so that even before 18th century, uh, 60 copies of Mona Lisa <laughs> exist. And I know Jeff has his favorite. I just show you four here. This is the Easelworth Mona Lisa, and they're all from the same time period, and a lot of uh, uh, scholars claim that these are versions by Leonardo, but now they're mostly believed to be by students and followers. Uh, this is the Prado Mona Lisa. Is this the one that you love, Jeff? Yeah, well, I, when I went to the Prado for the first time, I didn't even know it existed until I saw it there, and it was, it was really uh, interesting to study it and look at it, uh, especially in the context of the history of the Mona Lisa. And then we have the Hermitage Mona Lisa. Uh, for a long time, they claimed that this was the true one, and the, in the Louvre Museum was the replica. <laughs> it's not the case. And even my favorite, the nude Mona Lisa. <laughs> and this is uh, considered to be by Salai, Leonardo's favorite student. Uh, it, really interesting, this idea of the nude or the seductress. Uh, there's so many books and stories, uh, even uh, fictitious stories of Leonardo being obsessed and falling in love with Mona Lisa. And uh, so many have. Uh, she has traveled to many bedrooms. For instance, Napoleon loved her so much that he hung it in his own bedroom uh, in his palace and it was the revolutionaries that took it back to uh, the palace of the Louvre that, which became the museum for the people right so she has traveled quite a bit and and took many disguises but why is she called Mona Lisa? What's up with this title and who is she? And this comes really from this book, La Vita, uh, which means uh, uh, lives, lives of artists, which was written by um, a Renaissance art historian, Giorgio Vasari, in 1550. And uh, Vasari is basically like the great grand grandfather of art history. He was one of the first art historians uh, that wrote about Renaissance artists. And uh, it is in this book that he says that Leonardo undertook to paint for Francesco del Giacondo the portrait of Mona Lisa, his wife. So Mona Lisa literally means Mona, the woman named Lisa, right? Dona Lisa, Mona Lisa. And she's also known as Gioconda because she's married to Francesco del Giacondo. And he goes on to describe this portrait in the pit of the throat. If one gazed upon it intently, could be seen the beating of the pulse. And indeed, it may be said that it was painted in such a manner as to make every brave artificer, be he who may be, tremble and lose their courage. So it is as if after Mona Lisa, you just want to give up painting. You, you really shouldn't be holding a brush. Now, yeah. this is considered one of the most beautiful poetic description of a work of art. And we pause for a moment because uh, when Vasari wrote it, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was dead by 31 years. And Vasari himself was only five years old when Leonardo left Italy to France. So not only he's never uh, could have uh, known in person about how Leonardo painted or uh, um, uh, who he painted, but also 
he couldn't have seen this painting because Leonardo took a Mona Lisa with him to France. And we know that. Uh, what he could have seen, however, would be one of the versions, you know, perhaps one of the versions that we even saw a moment ago. So uh, the title, whether he might be correct, it might have been a portrait of uh, Mona Lisa, does not mean that the portrait in the Louvre or the painting in the Louvre is Mona Lisa. So this presents a big problem. And uh, we also know the painting under the name of La Gioconda. You've oh, for sure, Jeff, heard her name that, right? Yes. Uh, and Gioconda as well in French. So it comes from uh, uh, um, the name from the word Gioconda. You can almost hear the, the root for the joke, right? Jokingly or uh, jovially, um, <clears throat> which literally means a, a play, a pun on her last name, her married last name, uh, and saying that she, because she's smiling, she's the happy one, right? So Lisa Gerardini Gioconda, or just simply known as the happy one. Now, was it really a portrait? Uh, was Jaconda really a portrait? Um, I, I hear a quote, Nat King Cole, my favorite song. If you haven't heard it, please listen to it. If I had multimedia, I'd play it for you right now. And he says, you know, are you warm? Are you real Mona Lisa? Or just a cold and lonely, lovely work of art, right? He phrased it really well. There's so many pages of our historians writing about this. Uh, but many greatest art historians, the real true scholars of Leonardo da Vinci, both Kenneth Clark and Martin Kemp uh, believe that Leonardo's painting cannot be tied to a specific portrait uh, for different reasons. Uh, Kenneth Clark believed that it started as a portrait, uh, but because Leonardo returned to it over and over and kind of changed it to more of a generic image, it could no longer be considered a specific portrait. Martin Kemp went so far as to uh, propose that she should be renamed as a woman on a balcony. Uh, uh, but you could see that would be a problem with a tourism attraction, right? You no longer have Mona Lisa and you have a woman on the balcony. So uh, you can see why the Louvre Museum didn't go for that retitling. But uh, the, I just want to put it in your mind that the prominent scholars do no, no longer believe that this could be called Mona Lisa is not Mona Lisa, right? Um, but even, uh, even Leonardo himself uh, believed so strongly in the power of the painting. And this speaks to me as an artist. And he often argued uh, how much superior painting was to sculpture. Do not ask uh, Michelangelo what he thinks about that. But because I'm a painter, of course, I agree with Leonardo. And he himself had said, the power of a painting, this is by Leonardo, the power of a painting over a man's mind is such that he may be enchanted and enraptured by a painting that does not represent any living woman. So Leonardo is saying the power of a woman, the seductress, the beauty that can captivate male mind, right? Of course, a lot of the paintings were made for the male audience at the time. So hence, he's thinking about that. But what would be if he trumped that beautiful, breathing, living flesh and created a work of art that could seduce and captivate not just one man's mind, but unborn people for centuries, right? This is something that Leonardo is thinking about. This is not a quote directly uh, for Mona Lisa, but it's something from his uh, diaries. So she does become, however, real, uh, a real woman because she is literally abducted in 1911. And Jeff, have you followed that story? I have. Yeah, this is a really one of the most fascinating stories uh, <laughs> because one day, uh, the public came back on a Tuesday morning in 1911, and there was a hole in the wall. There was just dust, right? Uh, and, and just three nails where she was hanging. And everybody who worked in the museum assumed that because it was Tuesday, on a Monday, she got taken to be photographed because she was so famous. She was constantly, like a celebrity, was be being documented and reproduced, right? So for 24 hours, even though there was a hole in the wall, nobody realized that that she's gone missing. Uh, there was a huge panic arised after that. And uh, it was incredible um, how the media responded. Of course, now we are in uh, 1911 and we have uh, a magazine, Le Petit Parisien, which has 1.4 million in circulation. And they ran uh, uh, 
a, a newspaper with a cover, uh, Le Célèbre Tableau de la Jaconde, uh, Disparu du Musée. The Jaconde is disappeared from the museum. And down here, I don't know if you could see uh, to the left. Can you see my arrow, Jeff? Yeah. <clears throat> It says, comment, depuis quand? So how, since when? On ne sait pas, we, we don't know. <laughs> and then it's really funny, it says, il nous reste le cadre. At least we've got the frame. <laughs> <laughs> because the person who stole it left indeed uh, the frame uh, behind. Uh, here's another really funny cartoon. So they did not know for two years who stole it. And uh, this cartoon came out with this anonymous, you see a question mark for the face. He's uh, showing you kind of like flipping you off with the nose, saying the joke is on you. He's running barefoot. He's got Mercury wings on his feet because he's speed light, like Merc God of speed, right, Mercury? Mm -hmm. And it says, un jour, le sourire disparu, malgré le zèle bien connu du gardien et autres cancers. So it literally means, it just sounds so good in French. One day, the smile vanished despite the well-known attentiveness of the guards. And of course, you see in the back a guard that's uh, snoring, right? So many cartoons such as this. And uh, the, the, the newspaper speculated for about three months Every day there was a head cover about Mona Lisa. This is how she really became so famous. And um, nobody really thought of her as a painting anymore. Uh, they thought of her almost as a real woman. And they ran pictures of her either smiling or frowning, depending on the news. And uh, um, <clears throat> everybody thought, well, who could have done this? The first person who was actually arrested, uh, Jeff, did you uh, find that little funny tidbit? Or was no, under I don't suspect. That. I just remember, you know, the person who actually took it. I can't remember who they first. So took. they first suspected the first person to be questioned. You guys are going to laugh was Picasso, because who else would want to steal Mona Lisa? Somebody who understands about art, right? Somebody would be so obsessed about art that they'd want to have it for themselves. So he quickly was uh, uh, dispersed from being a suspect. But I just really funny, right? They wouldn't think that it could be anybody common. It had to be somebody very special. Uh, the next thing they actually suspected, because it could be an international yeah. provocation, it could be Russians or Germans uh, doing an actual political plot against the French. I mean, this is how bad uh, the whole, uh, uh, this became really politicized. Um, so, but in reality, it was this man who was barely five feet tall, uh, Vincenzo Perugia, an Italian immigrant who was a very nice, kind man, and he was working actually at the Louvre uh, just a, a few weeks before he stole the painting. As a glass cutter, uh, he would replace the glass in the building. And um, the French were not very nice to him. And because he was an immigrant, because he was very short, they called him Macaroni. And according to his daughter and one of the documentaries about him, she said, uh, he wanted to show you a Macaroni. And so he took Mona Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> to know uh, his actual worth and his status. So what did he do? He uh, knew because he worked at the Louvre previously uh, that they wore these generic white smokes, right? And he just wore that on a Monday morning when only the staff would enter through the staff entrance. And he just walked being very common looking, walked in unnoticed. Uh, he came to the Italian gallery because he was Italian. He was convinced that he wanted to return some of the looted Italian art by Napoleon back to his country, his patria, right? And um, he looked around and he actually said <laughs> that he was interested more um, in other paintings, but they were too big to carry. And Mona Lisa was the smallest. And so he wrapped her around and put her under his arm, very much like we see here, and just walked out. Um, he <laughs> didn't want the cumbersome frame, so he threw that on the stairs along the way, just tossed it and left. And that was that. He lived in Paris in a small apartment. Uh, it w he created, <laughs> with his friend's help, a trunk with a, a fake bottom, put Mona Lisa there, and she just lived in his tiny little apartment uh, for two years. Police did come to question him because he was one of the workers uh, at some point at the Louvre. They looked around 
out and never found they they just saw him so i mean this is not picasso this is nobody interesting and grandiose this is not russian secret agent right so they didn't even search the closet when mona lisa was right there and they left so after two years uh he went back to italy he couldn't resist and he offered mona lisa for sale to um an antique dealer and an antique dealer who saw her immediately saw that this is not a forgery and in fact even had a exact perfect serial number from the Louvre Museum in the back and uh, pretty quickly Perugia gets arrested but what's so interesting he also becomes a bit of a hero because uh, Mona Lisa is at last back in Italy and this is a wonderful uh, a quote by Gabriele D'Annunzio, a great uh, poet, uh, back to Florence, where she was born, near the Palazzo Vecchio, by the sounds of the bells of Giotto's Campanile. So Italians rejoicing, Mona Lisa at last has returned. Uh, the French were a little bit concerned, will it be returned to them? But Italians did make a pact. If you let us exhibit her and she can travel a bit before she returns to France, uh, she will, of course, return. Now, what Perugia did not know, that a Mona Lisa was never looted by Napoleon. She was again brought by Leonardo da Vinci with him when he came to France, and he kept her to the very end. We think that he actually uh, gifted it to his, or left it to his, willed it to his student, and eventually a uh, king of France purchased it. So it lawfully belongs to France. It has never been looted. It also has never been registered, back to whether it's a portrait or not, it has never been registered as a sale to um, Giacondo uh, or uh, Mona Lisa's husband, or never been seen in his inventory. There's an in inventory after his death of everything he's owned. Uh, so it's very unlikely that that was painted actually for uh, Mr. Giacondo. Now here is a wonderful postcard of Leonardo galloping back and uh, Mona Lisa is in the carriage. At last, they are returning. You could see the French. Uh, my daughter noticed that they all have like Dali mustache. And uh, there were 60,000 people awaiting for the return of Jaconda. And if she was famous before it was not really the steel that made her famous it was the return that made her famous right if she was stolen eventually those headlines kind of disappeared other works of art were stolen through history but it was the fact that she was found and how she was found that made her now the most talked work of art you could see this gentleman are receiving her as if a real woman has returned back to france and a new genre was born, mocking po postcards. So if you ever bought for a birthday card, a funny postcard, it was born from the return of Mona Lisa. And here they are, uh, you, could, you could collect them at the time. Where was she? Oh, she was near Big Ben. Or do you see this one? Where is she, uh, Jeff? Well, of course, in New York City. In, the in New York City, yeah. where else? Or she just took a cycling tour. Has anybody who's watching has taken cycling tour through France? Uh, what a fun thing to do. Or, Jeff, tell us where she is now. Oh, man, she's made it to Egypt. It uh, looks like our Rembrandt is doing a pilgrimage back there as well. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, a really wonderful uh, uh, series of these cards. I wish I could have one. So now we come for a very important uh, portion of our two together. What really makes Mona Lisa famous is her smile. And there's more written about that than almost anything in art history. And again, it was Giorgio Vasari in 1550 who talked about it. So I'm just going to move my, a little bit, my window here. Okay. And he says, oops, let's go back. He employed also the, this device, Mona Lisa being very beautiful. While he was painting her portrait, he retained those who played or sang and continually jested, who would make her to remain merry in order to take away that melancholy, which painters are often wont to give to their portraits. And this work of Leonardo, there was a smile so pleasing that it was a thing more divine than human to behold, and it was held to be something more marvelous in that it was not other than the life. So this is Vasari, in my opinion, totally making this up, kind of envisioning that, you know, his poetic license, he was also a poet, uh, that there were gestures, that, that 
uh, uh, that Leonardo wanted to entertain Mona Lisa so she would be smiling. Now, of course, if there were jesters and clowns, she would be laughing. Her smile is not, can barely be called a smile. It's so enigmatic, it's so subtle, as we will see, uh, that it doesn't really even fit this uh, circus description. Again, uh, Vasari was five when Leonardo left to France, and, he, and 30, Leonardo was 31 years dead when Vasari is writing this. Uh, where did, what do art historians think? Where did this uh, Mona Lisa smile comes from? Uh, many of them say that we could see the traces, the early traces of, of the smile, this enigmatic, uh, provocative, uh, barely a smile gesture uh, from uh, Leonardo da Vinci's teacher, Andrea del Verrocchio. And here we see a gorgeous charcoal drawing from the British Museum. And we see this kind of lips going up just slightly. If you cover the lips and just concentrate on the eyes, however, these eyes are not smiling. So it's just contained to the corner of her lips. Another uh, uh, direction that art historians often suggest we look was one of my personally famous artists, Antonella de Messina. One time we should do a tour just on him. And he does have a series of portraits where they're actually looking out at the viewer and seems to be almost teasing them. Uh, this one seems to be a little bit more closer to what, Le and this is earlier than Leonardo dated in 1474, about uh, 30 years before Mona Lisa. But when I looked at Mona Lisa, something felt so familiar that I couldn't find in any of the art historical books. And this is the reason why I wanted to do this tour, actually. actually. And this is a total surprise to Jeff. Jeff does not know what I'm about to reveal here. Uh, <laughs> this time, I didn't even, peek the, didn't even show him the PowerPoint. So I'm really curious to what your reaction will be. But something looks so familiar, I started racking my brain, what is it? And it took me back quite significantly in time, not to Renaissance, not even to Greece and Rome, but far beyond, to the Sphinx. And when we look at numerous representation of the Sphinx, he, she, it is always smiling. And exactly with a strange smile that could barely be called a smile. Now, just to give you a little bit of a background, what is a sphinx? First of all, that is a Greek word uh, that comes from the word strangle, because it was thought that if you uh, do not, if you cannot rise to the occasion, the Sphinx, uh, we're going to talk about the riddle of the Sphinx. If you can't rise to the occasion of the truth and answer the Sphinx, that he, she will strangle you to death. But this is a Greek name. The Egyptian name for Sphinx is actually lost. We do not know how to even address it. So for the lack of a better word, we use the Greek term. Now, Sphinx is associated with representation of time. And I was racking my brain, why time? And it's so interesting. Um, Jeff, do you have any uh, ideas or should I go? You go ahead and go. I'm fascinated okay. by this juxtaposition. Okay. It was so unexpected and so beautiful. I was sharing it with my 14-year-old daughter today because I was so inspired by it. Because Sphinx represents truth and time tells the truth. Right through time, you say the truth will surface, the time will tell, right? So time and truth uh, and this, this perpetual expression on the Sphinx face is supposed to show you this enigmatic truth that time will tell. Now, if we actually look at Mona Lisa and the portrait of Messina side by side, you could see a bit of an inspiration here and lay it over with the Egyptian Sphinx, you could see some uh, undoubted similarities, but we go even further. By the way, Jeff, what do you think? There is a similarity, there's no doubt. So let's look at the archaic Sphinx because the Greek or archaic Sphinx uh, 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 retains this idea of the smile and it even even more projected on its face. And uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what's important to understand the Greeks brought to, to this mythology, uh, the idea of the riddle of the Sphinx. For Egyptians, the Sphinx was a guardian, a guardian of the truth, a guardian of the passage of time between living and the dead, right? But for the Greeks, it was not only the guardian, but it asked you specifically 
specific riddle. So I'm going to ask this riddle to everybody who's watching, and I would like you to write your answers, your guesses, because I'll be reading them later. And um, the guinea pig will be Jeff, of course. <laughs> And there are two very famous riddles. I chose the least famous because then I thought you might have known the first one. And there are two sisters. One gives birth to the other, and she in turn gives birth to the first. Who are the two sisters? Wow. And sure. I have time. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, if you want to look at what our audience is writing, if you want them to bail you out, or if you want to phone a friend, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or take I, a guess. I, I don't know. I've never heard this riddle before. Yeah, you probably heard of the other one. Who has one voice, first walks on four, then on two, and then on three? Have you I'm heard that see, one? I'm going to see if I can uh, see what other folks are saying yeah. here. They're very curious. So we'll give them a chance, right? Our erudite audience. There are two sisters. One gives birth to the other, and she in turn gives birth to the first. Who are the two sisters? Yeah, I can't see them. I forgot to tell you that if you do not answer, you get devoured. Oh, man. So you might not want to guess this one. <laughs> Remember, Sphinx is to strangulate, right? So it will strangle you if you don't answer correctly. No suggestions from our audience? Did we scare them? I can't see their uh, responses right Just now. Just yet. So, okay. Sorry. All right. So the answer is actually night and day. Mm. They're continuous. This is a very poetic Greek metaphor, right? Would have fit uh, the Egyptians as well. Um, but this continuous, uh, why it's sisters? Because night and day in Greek is of feminine origin. The words have feminine root. So it would have been sisters, right, uh, for the feminine uh, word. Um, and they're continuous. Now, what's really interesting about that, uh, this is a riddle, of course, already known in, in Renaissance, that they represent chiaroscuro, the light and the dark, the sfumato in Leonardo's painting, right? This idea, this continuous, there are no boundaries between the light and dark. Uh, so uh, for me, poetically, it fits Leonardo very beautifully. Uh, we also want to pay attention, this is another archaic sphinx, what it consists of. So generally, if for the archaic sphinx representation, it's a female with the lion mane, and it generally has sometimes a serpent's tail, and sometimes lion or eagle's uh, wings and uh, lion paws. For the Egyptians, it's sometimes a woman, sometimes a male, sometimes a hybrid between the two. Very interesting for the Egyptians, what I've learned actually, uh, the Sphinx sometimes also carries the resemblance of the ruling pharaoh of the time. So it is a little bit of like Mona Lisa, portrait, non-portrait, right? Okay, here's another Sphinx from the later period, from 18th century, and you could see um, if this is a replica from Renaissance, and it has clearly become a beautiful woman uh, uh, in disguise of this monster. So when we look at Mona Lisa again, here let's project the Egyptian Sphinx, the two archaic ones, and the later 18th century one. And all of them, have that reminiscent smile that we see in Mona Lisa. This is what's so typical for it. But we keep going. Now for our audience, uh, vote please, uh, and I'll read this later. Yes or no, do you agree with this parallel um, or does this not look right to you? Okay, so we come to the very interesting part of our tour. Um, recently, there is a scientist, Pascal Cote, who used his invention in multispectral camera analysis, a state-of-the-art technology, and he studied Mona Lisa. This is the head of Mona Lisa. You can see a little bit of her hair. And he discovered through this analysis many interesting things, including that she has a number of pins throughout her hair that Leonardo painted. And between those pins, little pricks of the whole holes and uh, as if to suggest a design that he abandoned. For some reason, he decided not to paint it. But when Coat reconstructed the direction of this little dots that Leonardo left, the pinpricks in the design, it comes out at this, this 
head garment. And this head garment does not look like anything that, for instance, Mother Mary would wear or uh, a, a Greek mythological character would wear. Uh, when I looked at this, I right away wanted to check it with our Sphinx. So here is a, a, a Sphinx from the 5th century BC. You can see her wearing the crown. And as we get closer, it's nearly identical. So that kind of gave me chills. So I'm sharing you my own observations here because I was so excited uh, to reveal it. But here is the question. Um, there are many sphinxes that we find in Renaissance in architecture and in, in, um, in literature, in literary sources, in poetry, but do they exist in other paintings of Renaissance artists? That is the question that I wanted to ask myself. Is Le Leonardo making this invention or does this also exist in other paintings? So we're going to look at that in a moment, but before that, I wanted to share with you that I'm not alone in this uh, observation. In 19th century, many poets and writers were obsessed and they intuited that Mona Lisa had an association with the Sphinx. So this is by a very famous, beautiful poet and a historian, Théophile Gautier. And in 1867, he wrote, Sphinx of beauty who smiles so mysteriously in frame of Leonardo da Vinci and seems to offer to the admiration of centuries an enigma by them not yet solved. An invincible attraction brings every back to thee. So he's saying that Mona Lisa is an enigma and we love her and she's so famous, not because um, of, of the, you know, uh, of anything that you could write about her and of any theory. It is because of the very question. The enigma she holds within is something that Leonardo placed there uh, deliberately. And to my surprise, Oscar Wilde also wrote a story, a short story, The Sphinx Without a Secret, where um, there's a man who desperately in love with a woman and he shares with his friend that though she's dead, her smile is still like Mona Lisa drives him crazy. He cannot put her uh, aside. So, and this goes on in Russian literature. We find it in a famous writer, Mirishkovsky, where he refers to Mona Lisa as the Sphinx, but no art historian has ever brought this to light. So that's very interesting. It exists in poetry and literature only. And I told you that I was looking for a painting uh, that would contain uh, a sphinx. This happens to be by An Angelo Branzino, who is painting in Florence, in the same city of uh, uh, where Leonardo had painted, um, and in 1540s. So just a, a, a couple of uh, um, few, couple of dozen years uh, after Mona Lisa. And uh, there recently, in 1993, there was a discovery by Dr. John Moffat of a hidden sphinx inside this painting. So now it's my time. It's that time of the day where we torture Jeff. Jeff, <laughs> where is the hidden sphinx? Well, Can you I've find seen it? this painting before, too. It's a wonderful painting, right? Right, so famous, and it actually took me a while to find it. I will show you a detail if you give up, but I wonder if with that knowledge, if you look for somebody with a serpent tail and lion paws and scales on the body, who's also a woman in this painting, and our audience, we are giving away a surprise at the end, so if you comment correctly, that might be your chance. Where well, I see the serpent tail. The image is kind of small on my screen because I, I did finally find the comment section. But it, look, yeah, I was going to say it's behind Cupid, right? Right. There she is. Look at her. She's got the pearls in her hair. She's holding something in her hand. Her lion mane and her scary lion feet with the serpent's tail. And if we compare her to Mona Lisa, uh, she's half woman. Look, be below her green dress. You see where her sash ends and green dress? So we do not see what's below Mona Lisa. I'd like you to picture some monstrous body. And the idea is that uh, you do not want to fall for a beautiful woman who is a temptress, right? For she might be actually a monster. This might be a monster in disguise who might devour you if you can't tell the truth from lies, right? The painting itself is proposing this. Now, um, 
uh, Moffat pr proposed that there was a very famous book at the time. It's called the Theban Tablet of Cebus that was uh, translated from Greek and published in uh, Florence. It actually was published in late 1400s, so very likely that uh, Leonardo could have read it. Um, and he suggests that actually Bronzina is using this book as a reference for this painting. So if we go back, let's just see the full painting by Bronzina. Uh, uh, the book uh, describes a situation where there is a painting presented to the audience, to erudite audience, and there is a sphinx-like riddle. And if the audience does not realize it, they actually have father time. This is a uh, in Bronzina, uh, an image of time, Cronus, who is counting the time that if you don't answer it correctly, you will be doomed forever to ignorance. And in such a way, uh, uh, Moffitt proposes that Bronzina is asking us, illustrating and proposing this riddle that's hidden and the Sphinx-like character is proposing it to us. So could that be there is a test in Leonardo da Vinci, Mona Lisa as well? Now, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, also attract your attention that she is a sort of a guardian. Behind her, we find a landscape that's very ambiguous. Nobody has ever been able to really place it. And it's presented a big riddle because the landscape itself in the Renaissance portrait, especially with a woman who should be the owner of that portrait, should identify her. But this landscape does not look even Florentine. It is so um, uh, enigmatic. It's one of the biggest mystery in Leonardo. And she herself in placed in such a way that she seems to be guarding the entry. And as we look a little bit closer, you will find behind her the winding paths. Wouldn't we want to wander through this wonderful bridges and inspiring landscape? But we can't because she is like a sphinx guarding it, uh, the entry. Okay, let's go forward. Okay, so there's one more analysis uh, by an expert that I wanted to share with you. And this is by Dr. Elisabetta Niñeres. Uh, she's a fashion scholar, Renaissance fashion expert. And she looked at Mona Lisa and she reconstructed, she actually hired a model and sewed a dress uh, and made an exact replica. And she proved that Mona Lisa is not wearing a plausible outfit for a woman of 1500s, uh, particularly because she has this uh, shawl that's draping one of her shoulders. And that asymmetry would never be present in the woman of the time. It's always a symmetrical dress. And she suggested that it could only be a mythological character. And of course, we find this sort of a mythological sash often shown within the portrayals of Sphinx themselves. I also wanted to show you this landscape and for our audience, this is the voting time, yes or no. Does it look reminiscent of the one in Mona Lisa? And I let Jeff share what he thinks. Oh, it does look similar. You'll find the water expanse taking you in the middle. Uh, a range of the mountains almost look like a hand with, with fingers reaching up on the right. Uh, rocky uh, mountains up top with a diagonal quality on the left. And what I found interesting, what this landscape is, the title of it is Flight into Egypt. So this is a typical landscape that was adapted from painting to painting in 1500s, uh, representing the, the Egypt, Egyptian uh, landscape. So we have one more possible question mark. Is Leonardo trying to evoke uh, uh, Egyptian Sphinx or the tradition of the Sphinx coming from Egypt in this painting? So the enigma. Uh, there are thousands of interpretation of Mona Lisa that you can read about and watch movies about. Uh, but in my opinion, it is not about answering uh, what, what it is about. It is about asking the question. This is what I think Leonardo da Vinci was doing. He was posing a question. And this is by Charles Clement. As long as some vestiges of this fabulous and fa fatal being endure, all those who seek to decipher the mysteries of the soul on the traits of a face will journey towards this ageless sphinx. He's talking about Mona Lisa. 
ageless sphinx to demand the solution of the eternal enigma. We want to know, was she Mona Lisa? Was she not? Was she the mistress of the Medici, some say? Was she self-portrait that Leonardo reversed somehow into made a cross-dressing self-portrait? No, no, no. Lovers, poets, dreamers, go on and die at her feet. Neither your desperation nor your death will erase from her mocking mouth the enchanting smile. She'll keep on smiling because it is the enigma. This is a painting about proposing a question and therefore becoming the most famous in the world, rightfully so, because it will never give you the answer. Even your death will not erase her smile. And here I show you another postcard of Joconda joking. <laughs> and uh, what it says, ne pas au revoir, mais adieu. Je vais rire sous d'autres cieux which literally means, it's not see you later, but a goodbye. I'm going to laugh under different skies. <laughs> so uh, somebody thought that when she left, she left the museum because she was bored with the public. She was bored, bored being admired. And she went like a the painting just left by itself and said, uh, and not even see you later, not uh, au revoir, but adieu. That's it. I'm gone and I go to better skies where I'll be appreciated. And with that, we turn to all the wonderful questions and comments. And I hope that you enjoyed this journey. Fascinating as always, Jenya. And I have been able to access the questions now. So lots of good comments. Um, I'm going to back all the way up to the beginning. Uh, and uh, just kind of start where people were uh, uh, commenting on some of the early things uh, that were in there. There were more people who actually got the riddle. So while I was crushed and strangled, uh, there were some folks who answered correctly. Of oh. Vinyar, Dusk and Dawn. <laughs> so some people were the noble knights who made it across the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so they deserve great. to go to Egypt. Yeah, and there's a lot of people who are fascinated about the association with the Sphinx. Um, uh, somebody did ask a question, and I'm looking for that one now, um, about what references, visual references, would Leonardo have had in 1503 in Florence that would have he been able to uh, uh, source for a painting like that? Were there any references that you're aware of of a sphinx? Yes. So sphinx was abundant metaphor. We see it in sculpture and architecture predominantly repu reproduced numerous times. And if you go to any museum site like Metropolitan or the Getty and put Renaissance Sphinx, you'll have many, many objects that will come up. Oil lamps, uh, little decorations that survive from the buildings. It was literally everywhere. It was the, uh, quite an obsession of the day and the metaphor of the day, especially because of this text that I mentioned. Uh, that clearly described and evoked um, this idea of the idea of elevating yourself over ignorance because what is renaissance it's the rebirth of this purifying ideals that you are coming out of the medieval dark ages which we now find out were not actually that dark but there was some great art and uh, uh, literature but um, this idea of the rebirth of the classical ideas and it would have been um, of course the archaic the greek uh, version of the sphinx that was reproduced multiple occasions uh, the egyptian sphinx however was described already by the greek writer um, uh, uh, roman writer pliny and uh, you can find the exact uh, description of what uh, the Sphinx of Giza looked like already uh, uh, 2,000 years ago. So that was available for the European reader. So perfect. And what about visual images? I mean, were there copies of Sphinx available in Italy at that time? Were there? I know we had lots of Greek and Roman copies obviously, yes. that were inspiring Renaissance artists. So uh, literally uh, here at the Getty, we have a, a, a Renaissance, little tiny Renaissance Sphinx, a bronze uh, that would have been part of the decorative ambiance of the apartments of uh, a prom somebody like Medici or a very wealthy person. So you would see it in the living quarters. So literally available to, to uh, nobility and somebody like Leonardo da Vinci. There you go. Wonderful. Yeah. It, it, the one thing I've loved about your presentation, Jenny, and you kind of quoted at the end too, is you're 
you're submitting more questions. <laughs> it's like broadening the mystery, not not narrowing it. You broaden yes. it, I think, for everybody, which is the exciting part of it, right? And maybe that is one of the things that's at the heart of our interest and passion for this painting is that it does nothing but ask more questions, more questions of us. I, I thought your quote at the beginning too was very interesting. And I can't remember if it was Vasari's quote about a painting being able to beguile more than a living person, uh, that that image being more mysterious or having more meaning. And, and it kind of speaks to this idea of how we project meaning onto images. Photographs today, I, I instantly thought of the Mona Lisa and then pinups of the, of the 50s uh, and how there's a reality of the person, but then there's also what we project onto images that create something altogether different. Yeah, it's very interesting, again, when we think about it, uh, if I had to reconstruct in my mind, of course, I could be wrong. Nobody could know for sure. Um, I do think that he, like Kenneth Clark suggests, that he probably um, asked Mona Lisa to pose for him because, in my mind, I think he saw her, they were neighbors, and uh, we know that for sure. Um, in fact, her husband even had... Uh, uh, financial uh, uh, transactions with Leonardo's father. So there was a connection, personal connection there. Mm -hmm. And probably he saw her walking and thought, she is the Sphinx, she's perfect. You know, she's perfect for this enigmatic painting and asked her to pose. And even if Vasari was right, that he wanted, maybe she was very serious and he wanted this acrobat to bring up the smile. Maybe that's even possible, but he's not doing it as a portrait because again, it would have been in her collection, right? We would have known that again, because there's a detailed inventory of everything at their death, right? Everything that they owned. And we also know that Leonardo took Mona Lisa with him to France. Why would he take a painting with him? I mean, everybody always sold their paintings in Renaissance. It was always a commission, unless it had some kind of a deep metaphoric meaning that he wanted this little secret that he carried about art itself in a way, right? That he wanted to die with, that he wanted to take to his grave. Uh, this starts to make sense. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the... Uh... The idea was not his alone at that time. I mean, many artists of the Renaissance were mining classical antiquity for subjects. And, and we talked about uh, uh, disguised symbolism before we got on, on the call. So the, the possibility that he's using this person metaphorically or allegorically is, is, would be in line with many of the other subjects. Botticelli. Yes. Uh, and the birth yes. of Venus, for example. I, I mean lots of mythological figures and the clothing you pointed that out i'm glad you pointed that out because she's not dressed the way a person would be in a portrait you know she's not wearing the family jewels she's not overlooking the family estate uh you know all of her clothing speaks more to some allegorical figure than to a specific person and quite like quite uh, daring to paint something like that, right? Even yeah. in Bronzina, she is, after all, uh, you could see a beast, but here it's it asks for you intellectually to complete and paint what's beyond the frame. Uh, you talked about uh, behind the the before the tour started that what if the painting was larger? What if it was cut down? There's all kinds of speculations. Uh, you could just imagine this fierce body, right? But it doesn't even have to be painted. It could be painted in our mind, and then you realize: uh, do not fall in love. Do not be blinded by her beauty. Um, um, be clear in your mind about the truth, answer what is true to you, and then the passage will be open. The passage of truly embracing the intellect, the art, and Leonardo. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's fascinating. And, and uh, I, I was also uh, very glad that you brought this up as a subject. You had mentioned prior to the call how so many people kind of avoid especially art historians avoid the subject because it's been, you know, a, a focal point of art history for so long and they feel like they've run, it's run its course, so to speak. But there really are so many more questions and opportunities to analyze it, not only in the context of the painting itself, but Leonardo's life and the Renaissance and, and beyond. So thank you for bringing this topic back up and, and hopefully uh, reigniting some passion amongst our viewers 
for this iconic painting. And even reading about the Egyptian uh, prevalence in the Renaissance, there's a lot on, on, written on the subject matter. If you're interested, I really encourage you to follow those paths because you'll be surprised uh, about the mythology and the interest in Egypt uh, around Leonardo's time. Very fascinating. Awesome. Well, lots of good questions and comments. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry for you didn't get to answer a question specifically, but as I said, I will. Jenny will be back through all of these <laughs> and, and, and we'll be uh, 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 eager to see what everybody has shared. And uh, thank you, everybody, for doing that. I promised that I would pick a winner uh, also. Uh, and uh, our winner of the Rembrandt paint set is Robin Friend. Robin Friend. So I'm going to send you, Robin, a uh, message with information on how you can redeem your prize uh, for the set of Rembrandt oil paints. That is so exciting. So thank you, Robin. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, as always, Jenya, for fascinating uh, revelations on the history of art. <laughs> And, and uh, I'll just throw it out there for you, if you're still here and listening, that the next time we return, I would like to reveal uh, my uh, then would have been published article on the secret gesture in Renaissance. So stay tuned, come back, stay watch, tuned, watch yes. us. Lots of good shows on the future. We'll be posting those, of course. Uh, my final announcement is this Saturday, we have a workshop with Dina Peterson, who's one of our talent ambassadors as well. Uh, Saturday, April 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern. The tickets for this are available on our Facebook page uh, in our events links. Uh, all participants not only will uh, be able to enjoy the wonderful instruction and insights to painting like Van Gogh, uh, uh, but also everybody gets a six tube set of the Van Gogh oil. So if you're interested in that, there's still room to sign up. So please uh, visit us and sign up today. Uh, and thank you, Genia. Thank you all. And we'll see you next time on the Invisible Museum Tour. <laughs>